Everyone has a story to tell. We connect and relate to one another when we share our stories. My name is Amelia Old, and I am your host of Voices of Inspiration. Join me as I share stories of friends, family, and strangers from my everyday life and travels. You will laugh, possibly cry, but walk away feeling connected more than ever to those around you and ready to be the change our world needs. Everyone has a story to tell. What's yours? Welcome to Voices of Inspiration. I'm your host, Amelia Old. Thank you for joining me today. If you are new here, I share stories of people in my everyday life and those I meet along the way. I think we all have a story to tell, and it's my desire to give as many people as I can that platform so that we can connect and inspire each other on a deeper level. New York-born PJ Barnes was raised in Charlotte, North Carolina from the age of 10 on. Always passionate about the arts, PJ found himself attached to theater and joined his first troupe in the eighth grade. High school and college brought musicals and film closer to the forefront of performing. In 2009, PJ and best friend Keith Wellborn started their production company, Screw Up TV. Twelve years later, the duo have completed multiple short films, features, sketches, and web series. PJ has enjoyed a profession of teaching, acting, film, and hip-hop over the past decade, and he never misses a chance to help support a fellow artist whenever he can. Thank you for joining me, PJ. Thank you for having me, Amelia. (laughs) It's such a small world, and I always like to talk about the connections that um, I have with my guest, and I met your mom over 10 years ago uh, in the beauty and fashion (laughs) industry, and it mm. wasn't until my daughter started taking acting lessons three years ago, acting out studio, uh, mm. that I met you. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, no, when you first, I mean, my mom has all, like, I, 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 we got out here in 98. My mom has, has always been around. In fact, I was always like Sonia's son growing up. <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah, she's big in the fashion industry and, and image consulting and whatnot. It is a small world. So I was like, yeah, that, that, that's crazy how that worked out. I remember seeing your photo on her Facebook page. And this was right after I'd kind of seen you around the acting studio. And I messaged her and I said, is PJ a family member of yours? I didn't say son <laughs> because I was like, there's no way she has an adult son. <laughs> I said, there's, no, yeah. there's no way, no way. And she was like, yeah, no. that's my son. And I said, that is so crazy. Yes, um, man. That is me, Madre. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> one of my biggest inspirations in life. So. <laughs> well, I have never told you this, uh, but one day I was sitting outside of your classroom when my daughter Harlow had She had not been taking lessons for very long. And I was sitting outside of your class waiting on her to be done. And these girls in this class are giving you a a rough time that day. I mean, and (laughs) I've taught acting as well. And I know how it is. Somebody's got to go to the restroom. Someone needs water, but they all need to go together in a group. And, (laughs) you know, they were were like 11, 12 years old around that age. Mm -hmm. And I heard one of them say, you know what, PJ, you work for me. And I remember <laughs> sitting there and I'm like, this man is clearly a saint because yeah. your reaction yeah. was so calm and patient, <laughs> but yet funny. And I don't even remember what you said back to her, but I just remember saying to myself, hopefully they're working on a script. And she didn't really just say that to me. Right. I, I mean, <laughs> in all my years of teaching, one thing I, I, I realized is, is, is kids will, kids are unfiltered. They don't know like when to turn it on and turn it off. I've got a lot of patience. And that's why like I, I've always been good with kids growing up. I have a lot of little cousins and, and younger cousins, which I think prepped me for uh, teaching. I, like right when I got in college, I think my sophomore year in college, I, I, I was doing like tour college tours for schools and whatnot and teaching dance. So I've, I've gotten used to, I, I've heard it all. I've heard it all. I've, I've dealt with dance kids and dance moms and all that. I've, I've dealt with everything. So, And that prepared you for fatherhood too. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. This, I, I, all, all the tools I need. Although sometimes I'm like, okay, all right. Wow. This is 24 seven. All right. <laughs> yeah. It never stops. <laughs> never stops. But yes, man. So let's talk about your acting career. Like many of us, you have had experience in the industry for a really long time. You live it yeah. and you breathe it. And I think I even said to you the other day that 
even if you want to leave this industry, you're always roped back in every time. I know I've been in and out of the industry for 20 years and I thought I was finally done. And then when my daughter was three, she said, mommy, I want to be an actress. <laughs> and that <laughs> little dream of hers never went away. And, yeah. you know, now she's 11 and wants to be a director too. You started awesome. out at an early age like that. What was the moment yeah. that you realized, you know what? I really have a passion for acting. I mean, at, growing up as kids, we didn't have I, iPhones, and so we'd go outside and play games and Power Rangers and just pretend. We used to just call it make-believe. I don't know how many kids do that anymore. But so I think just when I found out that there was an excuse to keep doing that, <laughs> I think sixth grade, I, I was taking, oh, it was like a, a drama slash English class. And then they had one big uh, project at the end of the year where you could do a book report something something like four other options and one of them was like make a video where you interview the care yeah i had, I had jesse james but jesse james and then i ended up doing an interview style video with my brother i put my brother on and we made a video where i was jesse james and he interviewed me and i was like why would i write sit there and write a book report where i can just perform <laughs> this is way easier and way cooler and i think when i got to class and slowly realized oh i'm the only one who chose this option <laughs> This is super nerve wracking. But then when we showed it and people were laughing and, and entertained, I was like, this is really cool. And I think it just kind of went on from that. In middle school, I, I went to South Charlotte Middle School out here. And they would they would sometimes have these, these dare or drug awareness performances. And I would just always think it was really cool watching people on stage performing and whatnot. And we had a theater troupe uh, called the Shocking Players. And I remember in seventh grade, I was really wanted to be on. I had a few other friends who said they were going to be on it. We all auditioned. And I think me and another friend got in, but she decided to do yearbooks. Or so I was like, it was my first time going into like, okay, I don't know anybody going in, you know, and I fell in love. So it, it, it was eighth grade. I, I, I was in a troop. That's also where I started putting my writing to use. I've been writing since like the third grade. I I, I used to read Goosebumps books and whatnot and R.L. Stein and Oh, I remember you know, those. I, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And so I, I, I would re read them and then write my own stories kind of based off of those. <clears throat> and then so in middle school, I was doing uh, like, like, like I was writing little mini plays for the other shotgun players to go ahead and and perform. And at the end of the year, there was this performance at Blumenthal called Into the Arts, which was a, a spoof off of Into the Woods. Mm -hmm. And my drama teacher asked me to pick. apparently one of the students and the, the performance aspect had dropped out and they asked me to be a part of it. And at the time I was intimidated because I was the only middle schooler there. There's a whole bunch of the high school actors. And then I got to perform and it was in Bell Call. My first time performing Bell Call, it was, it was I didn't realize how big it was because it was a whole bunch of schools and marching bands. So there was, it was full because I mean, parent support. I just remember walking on stage. I played, I played Dreadly Locks. It was a spoof on Rumpel Stillskin, like Rapple Stillskin or whatnot. But so then I went out there and I told my first joke and I just remember the feeling of people laughing. I was like, this, oh, wow, this is cool. And it transferred from middle school on, onto a bigger stage. And I think from there, I just, knew I wanted to stay in, in theater. And so I are in performance. So through high school, I did theater all throughout high school. I went to South Mech my freshman year in Providence the last three years. And then I went out to, and that's kind of when, in, in high school is kind of when I found out, like figured my love for film more so. Cause I was like my, my last my senior year uh, in high school, we had like an A day and a B day and like my B day, started I, I took tv productions first where i did like the morning announcements then it was my theater class then it was lunch then i had english and then i had film <laughs> and so I like i had a high school a schedule like that <laughs> oh no I, I was loving it it was awesome I was like this is so awesome. like no math no like i had math on my eight days but I, I i've always tried to avoid math but Me no too. that's that's when i i learned how to start editing in in, in high school and, and just like in junior year, I, I remember looking at looking at, at the seniors do their projects and just kind of just really just soaking in kind of like what they were learning. And so by the time I got to be a senior, I, I was just trying to start producing my uh, own things. And the high school is where I met my best friend, Keith, and we would go, uh, we would every day after school, uh, like we, we would walk to work. All of our friends worked at Arboretum, so which is like a walk from Providence. And so I worked at GameStop, we worked at the movie theater, the, other friend worked at Harris Teeter, but like when whenever we get off, we'd shoot little videos around 
the Arboretum and we go to my house and shoot videos at home. And it's just, it's always been just a creative thing. I've just never strayed away, you know? And so going into college, I did the same thing, theater and, and then, and then into film. <laughs> and then you, you later on went to LA in your twenties. And I heard one interview that you did and you talked about using gift cards all the way to LA. And I love that <laughs> because you, you had this dream that you yeah. were going to get there. Uh, can yes. you talk about that? No, no, that's, that's funny. <laughs> one of the benefits of like, of, of, of teaching students is like during like holidays, you get, get some parents, you get like gift cards. And well, oh man, I, I feel appreciated. Thank you. Guys. So like it was 2013, I believe, early 2013, me and my best friend, I, 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 we had finished college in 2010, spent like an extra year in Wilmington, moved back to Charlotte for a few years. I was teaching at on stage, performing arts and just running their shows for a while. And we were making short films. Uh, we, we had started Screw Up TV and, and we were making some short films and decided, hey, let's let's try to go to LA and see what's going to happen. I mean, obviously going back on the planet way better. We would have had way more money saved up. <laughs> we had whatever money we had. I got a bunch of gift cards from the parents and I was like, this is our gas money. This is our gas money the whole way there. And we drove nonstop to LA and didn't spend any money because they, had, yeah, as you said, the gift cards were able to suffice us all three days or two and a half days. We left on a Wednesday and got there on a Friday. We, we, we had like a snowstorm in the desert. It was a crazy crazy trip i was gonna say uh, i've made that drive it is not a short drive (laughs) not at all no like it was bad i mean i don't plan on doing it ever again i i said that going out there and then when i ended up moving back we did it again (laughs) but but no it's it's definitely a grueling trip which i think uh kind of set the stage for like what what the first few, few years in LA would be like which is just it's it's a it's a grinder out there you know because before you go out there you know, all you have to go on is like the movies and like, you know, TV shows. Man, this is awesome. And then you get out there. Oh, this is just an old city. <laughs> yeah. It's like, and know. I think it's important for aspiring actors, actresses to understand it's not that easy to just yeah. go out there. You don't just go and get an agent and start booking roles. You know, yeah, you, you've exactly. got to work some other jobs too. And, yes. and even then, so you might be there three, five, 10 years uh, before mm-hmm. anything happens. What was crazy is, so we got out there in 2013. So there's three years in between me graduating. And so I had three years of like college friends moving out there every now and then, and like never really like paid attention that they weren't doing it. <laughs> I was like, you know, like none of them just made it. I don't see it. <laughs> and so like you get out there thinking, this is it, this is it. We're going to go make it not realizing at that exact same time there's hundreds of thousands of other people having that same trip right now going out with the exact same mindset and just by the, if it was that easy then everybody would just move to LA <laughs> which people do but no LA taught me a lot it was definitely a great experience like you said you work a whole bunch of different jobs I think at one time I was working five different jobs at the same time I was I was teaching theater at an all girls school I was selling solar panels i was selling kirby vacuums i was valeting cars i was teaching at a gymnastics gym i don't know how i got that job i was just keeping kids from falling on their head i was like i got you i'll save you (laughs) you know and so but doing all that trying to find a way to make things work I, i was still able to be somewhat creative out there but it taught me how much i love what i want to do we spent I mean, there's a good nine months where we were living in a car and, you know, at, at any point, I, I mean, at any point in time, we could have just went back home to North Carolina <laughs> and like, ah, we, we quit. But I think just going through not having a place to stay and then finally making it, working on those jobs and finally getting to a place where we have an apartment now, that feeling was something that you can't replace. And then like, but obviously straight from there, I'm like, now I can make a movie. <laughs> so, but L.A. was definitely a good experience in the journey, you know, went through a whole lot. What are some other challenges that you have faced as an actor? I mean, obviously, as an actor, throughout the whole career, 
you go through a million different things. Like when you're in the theater world, getting into different theater clicks is always a thing. You got to have that first audition and get into that first play before you're just like, welcome. <laughs> but I think that's, I mean, I'm sure that's for any, mm-hmm. any circuit around. But when I think I, I instantly realized that uh, if I'm only an actor, then by definition, I'm kind of putting my fate in somebody else's hands. And I think right when I graduated college, I got an agent out of Wilmington and started doing auditions for commercials. And this is after like a four year theater degree. So like this is a peak actor where I'm just like, I have my degree. And <laughs> when I'm doing these commercials and like the biggest biggest paying commercial I did was a, was a Burger King commercial. And in the actual final edit of the commercial, I just like walk up to the counter. I'm like, I can't put that on my reel. That's not, it's not like, it's not like acting. acting, Any, yeah. it's not acting. Anybody can do that, you know? And then for whenever I would get an audition for like a, a bigger project, like three stooges, the movie, you know, the remake, don't, don't you guys remember that movie? It did come mm-hmm. out, <laughs> but I, <laughs> You know, all my auditions for for the most part, and it's changed now, but like my auditions were like Thug Number One, Street Performer Two. And I was like, okay, well, I I can do more than this. You know, I didn't go to school for this. Me and Keith started Screw Up TV while I was still at my my senior year in college. We started in 2009. But it was at that point after graduating where I was like, I've got to make my own stuff to like, in order to show people what I can do. Otherwise, I'm pigeon held to whatever opportunities I'm given, if I'm given the opportunities. And yeah, I mean, just, just, just being in the industry, whether you're, you're black or a woman or, or anything, honestly, you, I mean, there, there, there's enough, like there's great people in the industry, but then there's some people in the industry where like, how did you have any friends growing up? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? So just no, noticing at, at an early age in my like post-college career, that I've I'm gonna I've got to kind of try it was one of those I, I can write I have a camera I've been shooting stuff with with this guy for years why can't I just write stuff that I want that I think is cool stuff we've been doing on the side the whole time and so that's kind of where I started really taking it seriously so in as far as the acting business I would say that was the first real difficult challenge for me to kind of just face or face it is like okay I don't want, I don't want my career to be dependent on somebody else, you know, and that's just growing and learning. There's like a gift and curse. Cause on the other hand, I was getting paid for Burger King commercial. <laughs> exactly. You <know>? so, <laughs> you get paid for the camera equipment that you need. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. That had sent me so far on one path of like, I'm doing, this is my path. I'm not, my, I'm not really trying to take a whole bunch of auditions and everything like that. You know, but then I was like, well, no, those auditions were making me money. So let me find a balance here where I can take auditions, but not take the audition thinking this is going to be my big break. I'm taking the audition like this is a check. If something happens, that's awesome. <laughs> but this is a job I can do where I can find something to work on in, in my craft. You know, I, I've moved into to, to directing and producing. And so just just getting into that, I've just seen other challenges, which I think a lot of time challenges comes from just a lack of knowledge from people there's there's knowledge that, that out there for people like now in in the youtube social media economy people are, are realizing i can take my future in my old hands and so now people are more so doing that but yeah no I, and you I have transitioned that. from being an actor to a director what do you think's challenging about bringing a script to life I would say one thing that you, as a writer, it's easy to get married to every detail of your scripts because it it came out of your head. It's your baby. But I think writing so much and producing so much, I, I've learned to like distance or, or allow myself to let an idea grow, knowing that there's going to be three versions of, of a product. There's the version that you write there's a version that you shoot and then there's a version that you edit and cut together and so just having trust that everybody that you bring onto the project has the best a final outcome in mind sometimes you know actors bring different ideas to to a set than you originally have and and just being okay are getting to point where like i 
gave you a skeleton of what this character can be. You go ahead and f- fill out the soul. I would say one of the hardest parts is probably dealing with people's schedules. So the more people you have, uh, the harder the schedule. And depending on what the project is, certain projects we do more for fun. So they're they're not so paid. And so if you're not paying people, then you can't really, you, you have to ask, when are you free? When do you mind coming out? <laughs> and, but e- even on, you know, paid events, people have, you know, just, just working with different size casts. We, we shoot from anything from sketch comedy to a feature film. For example, yesterday, three of us met up to do a sketch and we didn't know what we were shooting, but we met up and we're like, okay, here's the three who we have. Let's see what we can do with what we have here. Sometimes, but if it's an evolved sketch and we know we need this person, this person, that person, and we don't have that person, then we can't shoot the whole, you know what I mean? And so I think dealing with just schedules and whatnot, I've, organization isn't my strongest suit. <laughs> I think that would be my biggest challenge as a director. There, there, there are definitely people who I'm like, and there, there, there's two different types of directors, but there's definitely people who I like, who I look at like you, like you would be a great director in the sense of, of like, I know uh, your organization, like Alicia Price. She's somebody I'm like, I can't wait to see what you direct because <laughs> yeah. I know it's going to be very aligned. With them. So She's amazing. <laughs> she is absolutely, absolutely. And that's just been, been, been one of the, it. Filmmaking is problem solving. And so uh, wh- whichever area you're weaker in is, is, is the main area you're going to be doing the problem solving in. I would say those are probably some of the biggest challenges. What yeah. advice would you have for an actor on the best way to research and approach a role? It So I'll take this into, it depends. So if it's a fictional character, uh, if you're not playing somebody who exists already, I would say try to pull out every character from in yourself. Don't look at it as putting the mask on of the character because if you do that, you, you're already kind of separating yourself in the character. You know but what people want to see is is truth on on screen. I, I mean, you can, that's more elevant now than any because everybody watches podcasts and YouTube videos and, and they're just people. And so when you're you want to find out where they're coming from, so the point of view and perspective is very important. Obviously, you hopefully. It should be very hard to relate to just like a, a serial killer, you know, you know, but, you know, but there, there's times where like, I'm sure you're in traffic or, or you're in, in store where you're like, I'm going to go crazy. And so you want to find out how did this person get to where they are? And then, so I, I would say, tr- uh, look for the soul of the character and find out where they're coming from and why they are who they are and, 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 and start trying to find how you can relate that with yourself maybe you're not not a serial killer like maybe you just have like a list of people that you don't like in your head or maybe you're you have really bad road rage or maybe you're uh really ocd about everything you know what i mean and people who like leave their shoe or put their shoes on on the carpet drive you crazy so find ways to, to connect yourself with the character and the, and, the, and the harder the character is the bigger the challenge is but a lot of times the bigger the challenge is that that that's when you find some of your most exciting work, I feel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Two years ago, your life changed within seconds and you were involved mm-hmm. in a very serious car accident. Can you talk a little bit about that night and the days after? Yeah. Yeah. So that particular night. So we I I had been back in charlotte so this was 2019 the accident happened january 13 2019 i'd been back in charlotte for almost three years we got back in august of 16 and so my first two years back in charlotte i was working i was teaching like almost seven days a week nonstop, and i was doing that one to i just had a, a new son and so just overworking myself to, to the point where I was like, let me take some freedom to myself and start trying to, I didn't want to lose, leave LA and then lose everything that I wanted to do. Like starting a family doesn't mean you have to end your dreams. When I stopped that, I, I, I started focusing on my career more. I took up Uber as a second job. I just started to shoot the first season of our show Sketch, which was a new sketch comedy show that I wanted to shoot out here in Charlotte. And we, we I had met a few people over the few years that I was out here, started kind of working with them. We were shooting a sketch one night. It was pranked. 
And after we were finished, my DP needed a, a ride home uptown Charlotte. So I gave him a ride home. And then I decided to do a few Uber rides while I was out. So I did a few Uber rides. I think I did three Uber rides. And the lady, last lady, tipped me pretty good. And so I was like, well, that's my night. You know, I, got, I made more money than I want, than I thought I would tonight. So I was going to head on home. I started the head home. And the next thing I you know, I, I woke up in my car. And so it was really kind of jarring. I've only been technically unconscious one other time in my life, other than me asleep, one other time in my life. But it, it was just a weird feeling of, of this confusion, kind of like wanting to know where I was. It was feelings of like, where am I? Oh, I'm in my car. What happened? Oh man, did I, I messed up. I was, I was like, I messed up. <laughs> I did something mm -hmm. wrong, right? Hit something. And then, you know, then it was, I'm alive. Okay. Now clearly wasn't my time. So then I started looking around in, in the car. I, I kind of hear some people outside. I'm trying to call my wife or my mom to let them know I'm okay. Uh, but my phone is like busted. And I was like, really, I was like, man, I drop my phone all the time. And of course, now it's smashed. <laughs> so this sounds like okay. And, 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 and like I remember it fell on my hand because my arm was dislocated. And I didn't realize that my arm was dislocated. I didn't realize I was, I was hurt at all. I thought I was like being Batman. I was like, internals okay. I yeah. think I'm good. <laughs> so, it's like, not the case. Then yeah, no, then then there were people shining flashlights trying to wake me up or, or trying to see if I was awake. And I was like, I guess, I guess I was not out or, or whatever. And then they told me to stay away from the door. They were, trying to open the door I was, but my knee was messed up or i didn't realize my knee because I'm, I'm skinny i was like i know i'm skinny but i know i'm bow-legged but this ain't this seems wrong here <laughs> you know so so it, it was interesting so then they cut me out the car and put me on the gurney and that's when i realized i was like oh i'm hurt because i felt like my, my my pelvis shift and so then i guess then the ambulance is when they start gassing you with that medicine because that's when things start getting kind of crazy and like kind of like just in and out. I just remember seeing a uh, wall or ceiling tiles, <laughs> then in and out, then being under like some kind of CAT scan machine and in and out. Then at one point I thought it was like, at one point I thought it was like strapped 50 feet up in a wall, but I was, I, I think I was just lying. I don't know. I was all disoriented. You were going through but a lot of shock, yeah. I was going through a lot. I remember they, because my phone, I wanted to call my parents. Yeah, yeah, because eventually I was like, I, I, I got to call my parents. I got to call somebody. <laughs> I was like, all this flashing in and out. I've got to let some, nobody knows where I'm at. So I was like, I wanted to call my parents. And at the time I was also, I was Ubering, but there were a few other people, disabled people who I was uh, driving around town. And I remember, which, I mean, the lady who I was supposed to pick up the next morning, she was missing a leg. And I remember just like trying to tell everybody, let her know that I'm not going to make it anymore. I'm trying to tell the doctors, like, please let her, because she's, because she doesn't know I was in an accident. So she's going to be waiting for me. Then I remember them saying that, that they might have to amputate my leg because of the bone that was broken, the artery was broken. And so I, I was like, no, please don't do that. Save my leg. I don't care if you, I don't, I don't care if the leg is all you save. If you <laughs> so, but no, it was, it was definitely interesting. And then I do, and then I spent the next 10, 10 days um, in the hospital kind of recovering, you know. I, I remember during that time, and of course you and your family would know better than I would, but it seemed to have been that the entertainment community really surrounded and embraced your family during that time. And I thought that that was really special having come from a different market myself and s still somewhat new to Charlotte. My, you know, my experience has been in Atlanta and I thought that that was just, it seemed like just a small community that just really wrapped their arms around you. Yeah, no, I mean, honestly, that's, I mean, that, that still, it still means like a lot to me, you know, I, I think I work a lot, you know, and so I don't, I don't ever like take time to like look back at like kind of like what, what I've done or anything like that. And so I think I hadn't realized how many people I, I knew at that time and, or, you know, it was, no, it was definitely touching. And I think I can probably attribute a lot of that to my recovery as well. Mm -hmm. You know, were you and afraid I, during that time that it would affect your future career? For sure. Absolutely. I was in a wheelchair. And so I, I, I had danced my whole life as well. I was a choreographer. I just choreographed West Charlotte's musical. You know, so I, I wasn't sure what 
everything was going to be like, you know, the, you know, the doctor said, you're going to recover soon. I'm like, doc, I can't, I got five people helping me move from one bed to another bed. I can't even get up to use the bathroom. I, 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 so it was, it was definitely hard, but I, I made a decision that like, I, I, I can't, I can't sit down and mope and stare at the ceiling and look at the wall and do all that. I got a wife and I got a kid and I'm alive. I can't just be depressed the rest of my life. I got a whole, like, what if I live another 80 years? <laughs> and as an outsider looking in, you know, obviously I followed your journey and you didn't sit back. I mean, you were filming pretty quickly once you were home. Um Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't wait. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I I had the advantage. Like, like look, I'm I'm glad that I started filming a a passion project before my accident, because then it gave me something to pick right back up on and focus on. Where I didn't have to focus on being in a wheelchair, I could focus on still being creative, you know. And it just became another challenge, you know. I, I now I can't. I can still write this. I don't have to be in every sketch now. Now I can bring in more people to help on and and, and, and do the stuff that uh, do the stuff that that I can't and and for the stuff that I can do I I did that I'm so thankful for for all the people who came in and and help and helped with the season not only because they're helping with the season but they were also helping me kind of like recover and 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 get back to to where to where I am now and and it allowed me to have a lot of different new relationships and friendships that have I hope to continue so <laughs> well I think that that shows who you are and your character for those people because you made an impact on their lives so of course that they would want to be there for you so I think that that shows a little bit of who you are you know and you've continued I mean you got married a few months later and you're continuing yep. your family so you have all these amazing things do you have anything else in the works that you can talk about I know you just had a project that uh, was released recently that you filmed during the pandemic. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, we shot we shot a feature film. It's called All We Got. It's uh, all done to Charlotte Talent, mostly Charlotte Talent. Yeah, mostly Charlotte. I don't, I don't think anybody came from her. So <laughs> EB came, but she's kind of from Charlotte. No, so I, uh, yeah, so we, I, I started writing. So we talked about Alicia earlier, you know, and Natasha, Natasha Adams is is, a, is another actress who I, who I met with, within the past few years. We, we were on the improv team, and then she's one of the other people who, who came in and, and was there during, like, my whole recovery and whatnot. And so just... Another very talented person. Super talented. One thing I love is, like, like I love talented people. You know, I, I, I love talent. And my whole life, whenever I've, I've seen a talent that I feel like I have a chance to try to work with, I try to work with them or, or, or try to find a way, you know, and, and that's been from middle school when I was writing like the things that plays in shotgun players. I was like, oh, Chris Shinner's a really good actor. I hope you, I hope you say yes to my play, you know? <laughs> and so like I had, I, I'd known I'd wanted to work with these actors for, for a while. I was trying to figure out what the project would be. And my senior year in college, I did a play called um, Our Lady of 121st Street. And that was kind of, I was going to try to produce that play and kind of bring up bring a whole bunch of those actors on and then i was like let's just make a short film and so I, like like i reached out to uh, keith who is he so we, we we both moved out to la at the same time but i moved back when my son was born so he was still currently out in, in la i reached out to him and said hey man uh you know these, these two actresses out here alicia and natasha i got this idea i want to shoot something with them they're super talented i got this idea and i always have crazy i i, I can have a crazy idea i, I was like let's do like a western we're like bandits on the run and the whole movie takes place of like one night where we're on the run and, and, and they meet each other and and so and he was like i don't know if you have the budget for that and pj are you you know i've never seen you on a horse before <laughs> so I was like, okay. all right let's let's bring it back down and so he's like let's do a family film I was like yeah family film that works and so that, and sometimes I feel like he does it on purpose. Like, like, like he'll give me a spark and he knows I'll run off with it and get to the lab and start playing <laughs> it. <and laughs> that. But, uh, but yeah, so it, it started off kind of being like a short film and then we just kept on writing. It, 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 it's all we, it's called all we got. We called it a, a dysfunctional family dramedy. <laughs> and as we were kind of putting it together and whenever we'd bring it up to talk to somebody about it, uh, they would always relate to the story, which was there's these four siblings, the oldest sibling 
moved away from her crazy home and family and whatnot. And then one day she gets a call from her youngest uh, sibling saying that their mother passed away and she has to come home and they kind of got to figure out what to do with like the will and affairs and everything. And everybody has a family and at, at some point, everybody's going to have to go through the situation in some way or another. There's no relationship quite like you have with like your siblings. There's so many different dynamics and, and whatnot. And not everybody always gets along. And sometimes even if two people are the same person, then sometimes they don't get along more. But we also wanted to kind of, kind of, kind of tell the story, the overall arcing story of family and that as an adult, sometimes we got to have these hard conversations. You know, two two things I've learned as an adult is one, you're not the center of everybody's universe. And two, you're not always right, you know? And so one thing that we wanted to show in all these siblings' arguments is to show where everybody was coming from so the audience can see, okay, I can see how they got to this point and you can empathize with everyone. Like, and you can see how just the misunderstanding or lack of, under- of understanding could cause a rift, you know, where where the oldest daughter thinks that she left the family, but she left her siblings together to have each other they look at hers as you've abandoned us. You know what I mean? And so there's these, all these juxtapositions and in, 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 in realities and whatnot that we, we wanted to kind of touch on with that. And so, but yeah, uh, we wrote a March, we shot it. Then the pandemic happened. We shot it uh, right at the end of June when things kind of opened up a little bit in July. We got lucky because one, one, Pe- Harry Fowler, Petra's is, is, is one of the main restaurants that we used for it. And, it was closed because it was a pandemic. <laughs> and so we're like, hey, can we come in here and film? And he was like, yeah, come come on through. And so one thing I've learned is like, 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 like the worst you can hear is no from somebody, you know? And so I'm never afraid to ask anybody for anything, you know, because if they tell me no, I don't burst into fire or anything <laughs> like that. You know, a lot goes on. We filmed 17 days, but that was over the course of like two and a half months. I would say. And then I started editing it in the winter and then it came out on Amazon in February, and now it's on Tubi TV and uh, YouTube movies and YouTube TV and Google Play. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. But that that's another thing when when it comes to just like knowledge. Like I feel like like I, I've been studying distribution for the past. I mean, we shot a movie in LA that we never put out. We shot a few movies like kind of feature length, but we decided like they were never at something where like, we we want this to be our first thing out there. And so I think that's, I mean, all we got is by means. No, it's it's not perfect. It's not, it's no big blockbuster movie or anything like that as far as budget or whatnot. But it was the first one where we're like, we think this one's good enough where where we can put it out there and and, and, and represent like what we can do. There, there's another film being made by two, two friends of mine uh, called no justice, no peace, a producer. And now I'm just kind of helping them out. just trying to help them, make sure that they get it done and even though we got all we got out on platforms i still learned some lessons along the way so i'm going to take my lessons and help them along their way i'm working on a haunted house film right now which i pitched to a pitch competition back in january and it was in the top three picks that one i'm kind of in wait and see mode because that that's on a different level than anything i've done before because i think there's going to be a little bit of backing a budget for that one where i'm used to working with what I call the, the MacGyver budget. You know, what do we have in our pockets? You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it sounds like you have quite a bit going on. <laughs> yeah, I, I try to stay busy, but then sometimes I, I, I overwhelm myself. But um, I know that feeling. Yeah. <laughs> Where can our listeners find you and all of your projects online? Yeah, they can find. So all of our sketch and funny stuff is at Screw Up TV. That's at screw up on or at screw up TV on Instagram. Uh, you can go to screw up TV productions or screw up TV on YouTube and Facebook. The movie is all we got. That is all we got. Uh, that is on Amazon prime. Give it a good rating. If you, if you like the movie uh, <laughs> in a review, all we got. It's also on Tubi TV. It is also on YouTube. If you just have YouTube, type it in and then there you can rent or buy it on YouTube. And it's on Google Play as well. But that is where you can find some of our work. If you want to follow stock pictures of my family and kids, 
Follow me at Plymouth Jones. Uh, it's Plymouth, Plymouth Jones. <laughs> so. And I will make sure to link to all of these websites under the notes of this episode at VoicesOfInspirationPodcast.com. PJ, you've been through a great deal and you continue to rise above. Do you have a favorite quote or any words of wisdom that you would like to leave with our listeners? Um. So hard work and perseverance. I would say the only... I heard this a long time ago and I think it, I think just my lived experience just proves it true. I think the most successful personality trait or the only personality trait that almost guarantees success is perseverance. You know, I don't think like out of my graduating class in, in college, I don't necessarily, I think I'm any talented than any of my peers or whatnot, there's people who just stopped along the way, you know, uh, it's not a race, it's a marathon. So go after your dreams and, and know that you're going to fall down. It's not going to be easy. Otherwise everybody will do it. And if it's something that you really want to do and, and you really want, you're going to per- persevere. I definitely like after my accident, I definitely had my days where I was just like upset, you know, and it, it, it's totally valid to have those days and, and, and whatnot. But know that you can't live in there and you have to get out of it. You know, when I was when when I was living in a car, there's a lot of other people who are also living in cars who are probably still living in their cars. And it's a mindset thing. And once you give in to a certain mindset, then it's hard to come back from that. So just stay on that track of hard work, perseverance and knowing that this is my journey. My journey is unlike anybody else's journey. And I might make it faster than other people I might, it might take me longer but whatever it is it's your journey and so that's that's what i would have to say that's great advice thank you for being with me today no problem thank you for having me <laughs> um, thank you for inspiring and and encouraging hundreds of young people and your peers in this industry i know that my own daughter looks up to you as an actor and as a director and as a comedian And I look forward to really continuing to follow your journey and your path to see what you will do. I know that you will do some amazing things. Thank you. Well, yeah, you will definitely hear from me because Harlow is an amazing, talented (laughs) actress. And so I don't have to look far, far from from, from whenever I need her type. So, (laughs) Thank you. Thank Thank you to our listeners. There are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and I'm so grateful that you have chosen to join us. My name is Amelia, and I'm your host of Voices of Inspiration. Everyone has a story to tell. What's yours?